I'm the dude. So that's what you call me. Are you a virgin? Yeah, not, not since I was 10. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Come on to the coast. We get together. Have a few laughs. Hey, gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits. Eventually. Welcome back, Movie Minglers. I'm Caveman. And I'm Maggie. And this is episode 9 of our series from Letterboxd, Top 75 Animated and Live Action Films. And that brings us to episode 9, Knives Out. But before we dive in to this movie, we have just one announcement to make before we go any further. Two weeks from the release of this podcast for Knives Out, we are going to be releasing a special bonus episode just for Star Wars Day, May 4th. I'm very excited for this podcast. Um, If you guys don't know, and most of you don't, Caveman and I are diehard Star Wars fans. We've seen all the movies. We've seen most of the shows. We've got deep opinions about the cartoons and all of the other wonderful things. So, yeah, May the 4th, we'll be dropping a uh, probably not terribly sober Star Wars episode. It's just going to be Star Wars, all of it. The shows, the movies, the music, the spoofs, all of it. It's going to be great. Yeah, we're just going to cover top to bottom Star Wars, everything that we've at least experienced and seen and listened to. and Been on the rides you know our tattoos (laughs) Um, it's all going to be discussed in a probably a pretty long episode i can't wait it's going to be so much fun which is it's star wars is nowhere to be seen on the on this list unfortunately so to make up for that hey might as well do it ourselves yeah i mean we've got a podcast so we can do whatever we want with it so we're going to star wars it up a bit it's not going to be officially part of the list the list is still going to be numbered one through seventy five. Yeah, it'll as, be a bonus going, episode. It'll just be a bonus episode, and like the Oscars episode, which you guys seem to love and, and may we're the glad f- for. May the fourth is a Saturday. <laughs> I'm very excited. Knives Out was released in 2019, directed by Ryan Johnson. Speaking of Star Wars. I'm, I'm going to do a real quick rapid fire starring because this list is thick. The cast is incredible. So we've got Daniel Craig, Chris Evans, Anna de Armas, Jamie Lee Curtis, Michael Shannon, Don Johnson, Tony Collette, Lakeith Stanfield, and the amazing Christopher Plummer. I don't know how many Ryan Johnson movies you've seen i mean the last jedi the two knives out movies maybe a couple of them. I don't did know. you watch brothers bloom with me i feel like i've seen that movie i don't think i've seen that Back movie in 2008 with so... you Ooh, mid 2008 2008 i kind of have a vague rem- uh, memory of watching that but i probably saw it in 2008 the... or 2009 doesn't one of the brothers I... die at the end i haven't I haven't seen it since 2008 or 2009, so okay, I have no well. idea. What, I just remember I watched it and I tolerated it. It was I'm I I'm in, it. I'm indifferent about it because it's been so long and I wasn't really into those kind of movies then. So I'd love to revisit it sometime. But you also got Looper, which I don't know if you ever saw Looper. Never saw it. Didn't care to. 2012. It's personally, it's one of my favorite Ryan Johnson movies. I thought um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was really good, especially. Even though they make him uh, look like, uh, what's his face? Bruce Willis? Yeah, he's still, what, how does that change his performance? Yeah, I mean, I just didn't care. I was a, I was a little annoyed because I, I like, the. I think Joseph Gordon-Levitt is a very handsome man. And it, it kind of sucked that the whole film, he's got prosthetics on his face to make him look more like Bruce Willis. Then, yeah. of course, you've got... The much loved and uh, very uh, well welcomed into the Star Wars family, uh, Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Oh yeah, that movie wasn't in any way controversial or uh, picked apart by nerds, but that's for our episode coming up on May Fourth. The really the only movie I haven't seen from Ryan Johnson is a movie I think is his first movie, two thousand five, called brick 
and I, I know absolutely nothing about it. Um, but this is definitely my favorite Ryan Johnson movie, period. I yeah I I so we will eventually cover um, Knives Out, The Glass Onion, A Glass Onion, Glass Onion, whatever. Um, it is on this list. It's much further down. Uh, so I'm gonna try really hard not to compare the two because I'm gonna save that for that episode. It might happen a little. But I, I mean, I think I've preferred Glass Onion to this version. This movie is great. Like, don't get me wrong. The cast is phenomenal. It's the writing is so good. I could watch every single Blanc detective movie that is made. Like, give me all of them. Um, but I, I just think I preferred Glass Onion a little bit more. So, but that'll like, be a yeah, fun conversation. Is, come Glass Onion. This is like easily top two. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, a Star Wars sequels apologist. Um, I love those movies, but yeah, the. Ryan Johnson's was definitely the weakest of the three, but uh, that will be for, again, mm. our podcast. See, that'll be an interesting conversation because <laughs> I disagree with that. Yeah. This was also Christopher Plummer's last theatrical live action film. Which is a bummer. I mean, he he was an old man who lived a good long life, but what an incredible actor. What a really fun movie to end your career on, too. Yeah. It could have been a lot worse, like... Kevin Spacey, who... Christopher Plummer <laughs> came in and reshot all his scenes for some movie I never even ended up watching. No, I could. I was gonna say it could have been a lot worse, like Orson Welles' last movie being that Transformers cartoon. You know, how, some people. How dare you? Some people go out on a low note. Is all I'm saying. Wow. <laughs> wow. Now we're adding Transformers to the movie. The uh, only if we can do all the Transformers movies. Oh God. Oh my God. <laughs> Because <laughs> wait, <laughs> to be fair, look forward to that what? really, really inebriated <laughs> oh podcast because that's be the so only stoned. way I think you could get me to talk about those terrible movies. And to be fair, the first one's fun. We've got a lot of we got a lot of history at the we've first got one. a lot of history at the first one, but, but after that, yeah, it's diminishing returns all the way down oh, into God. the garbage heap that it is today. There's a. I looked up the synopsis of this film just to see what was written about it, and I think they were really trying their best not to give away any spoilers because it's one sentence which reads, A detective investigates the death of the patriarch of an eccentric, combative family. Yeah, if you haven't seen Knives Out, I wholeheartedly oh. recommend just Stop putting, the podcast yeah, putting the podcast on hold and spending some time watching that movie. It is a ton of fun. It's wacky. It's screwball. It's a solid like mystery detective thriller. The cast is incredible. It has it, a lot of originality to uh, oh, you know, it's mur so murder smart. mystery. Murder yeah. mystery movies are a lot of times very cookie cutter. Like, very formulaic. I mean, very. you've seen one uh, Puro movie, you've seen them all. You see one episode of Law and & Order. And yeah, this no. Is kind of, that's kind it's of It's always the, the guest star that did it, guys. It's the one that, yeah, like, if John Stamos is on an episode of Law & Order, surprise, he did it. We'll get into it a little later, but this movie was compared a lot to the film Clue. I haven't seen Clue in so long that but I don't even the, think but I could But for reasons the why, because I think that's another murder mystery movie that really was fun original and uh the reveal of who did it was creative so maggie what did you think the first time you watched knives out was it an immediate like that was re like really really i don't know you tell me I, <laughs> <laughs> i'm not even gonna put words in your mouth Just you know i kind of don't remember watching this movie for the first time we all know what it was like trying to remember anything pre-pandemic. It was yesterday. It was 10 years ago. It was, it never happened. It, time has no meaning. And time has no meaning. You know, it's all made up and it's all very silly. I remember, I don't think I saw it in theater. I know I didn't see it in theater. And I think that I was intrigued by it. But also at the time we had younger kids and getting, there was a while there. There was a good like half a decade plus where it was hard for us to go see movies together. And so we were more selective about the ones that we went to see together and separately and we're working parents and, you know, it's hard. So we saw it in our home. 
I don't think I had to be dragged into it at all. I think that I was just like, oh, yeah, I like the people in this cast. Like, who doesn't love Chris Evans? I saw all the discourse about his sweater. So, like, yeah, let's let's watch it. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think I enjoyed it a lot more than I expected to, especially after having seen The Last Jedi and being a little iffy on Ryan Johnson and his work. But no, I, I was I was thrilled from the get. I mean, it's such a rich movie that just pulls you in. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And although I've only seen it twice, because this was the second time I've watched it, it's a movie that I could easily watch again. And honestly, the only reason that I haven't watched it again is that it's not on Netflix. And for some reason, I thought that it was a Netflix-based Netflix -based movie, because the second one is. And so when we tried to pull it up the other day, it wasn't on any streaming platform. And, you know, Caveman dug the physical copy out That's of right. our That's right. Physical media, everybody. Physical media, guys. Like, it's making a comeback, and it has never not been a thing in our home. I'm pretty sure you probably bought it, it as soon as it came out on, on Blu-ray, right? I think I did. Yeah. That's like, how much I liked this movie was as soon as it was available. Did you see it in the theater? I don't remember. Oh, yeah. I I honestly I cannot remember if this was something I just I mean what it was home close or? to it was just over four years ago like that was it's a thousand long. years yeah, ago it's too long ago to remember <laughs> who remembers 2019 for any reason but no I, I thoroughly enjoyed this film I can't wait to like dive into it I can't wait to talk about how much I love Michael Shannon who honestly might be my favorite uh, person in this whole movie The movie starts with this really neat slow motion of uh, the two German do German shepherds running towards the camera. And at the moment when you first see that, it's like, okay, there's two German shepherds running towards the camera. And it's fun that they don't touch on that moment again until the very end of the movie. Oh, were they chasing after... They're chasing after... Or they're running to the fence where... Um, Ransom. Ransom is... You know, I used. might not have put two and two together. <laughs> <laughs> I have watched this. You have you said you watched this. This is your second time I'm pretty sure it? this is my second time seeing it. And I probably since we own it, I, probably half a dozen for me. Yeah, I've, I've seen Glass Onion at least three times and maybe more if you count the amount of times I watched people watch it on YouTube. So Glass Onion is the one I'm much more familiar with. Aside from the German shepherds, the next shot is the coffee mug that says, my house, my rules, my coffee, and it's fun because it bookends the movie. Very much so. One thing I did notice about um, the movie right away is the decor in the house. So it's a giant mansion. It's owned by a famous and very successful murder mystery writer, Harlan Thromby, who's played by Christopher Plummer. So there is clowns and skulls and weird paintings and all sorts of like, this is a house that you would imagine that a rich kind of nutty writer it's, would have. It's the house it that seems, I would have if I ever became a rich writer. It seems like things that probably inspired him oh, or absolutely. things that later on maybe he saw that reminded him of a book, but I could see him owning things that then inspired him or, or bought an item to write about it. But the item, you know, you could be very, it's easy to be descriptive about something when yeah. the item is sitting right in front of you. Yeah. But it's a very, just like, it's a warm house. It's a lived in house. It's a big house, but it just, you know, it's not sterile. There's the giant like throne of, of knives um, sitting in one room. There is a, a portrait of Harlan that hangs in the the house that like its facial expressions change a lot. Like I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but the like the expression on his face changes kind of with the mood of the movie. I have never caught that. In and the... like at the end he's smiling. Are you sure down. you've only seen this twice? Well I did read that on IMDB. Cheater. Our non sponsor sponsor. Our non sponsored sponsor. It's funny because in my notes I was talking about how there are too many clowns in the um artwork around the house and then i went off on a bit of an insane thought about ryan gosling uh that i wrote down for several sentences and then just wrote back the family dynamic there was a line from lakeith stanfield's character that Who said, is so sexy the line goes look around the man lives on a clue board then and, and if you know what a clue board looks like the library and the billiards room and the yeah just it's everything, very much it's, clue -esque. You know, the mansion the mansion speak of, speaking of the mansion that exterior shot with the German shepherds, mm -hmm. 
The mansion from Clue and the mansion in this movie look very similar. Which was probably done on purpose. Easily. I think there's a lot, like I said, this movie's been compared to Clue a lot. Yeah. And not that it's copying the story, but I think the aesthetic for sure. Which is cool. I mean, everybody knows Clue. Everybody knows, you know, Mr. Plum in the basement with the the hatchet or Mr. whatever. Mr. Plummer? <laughs> hey. Um, we meet the incredible cast um, very quickly on because they're all there because their father, Christopher Plummer, has supposedly killed himself on the night of his 85th birthday. I think it, I think it was 85. Yeah. And so, you know, you have Jamie Lee Curtis, who is so shrill and so good in this movie. You have Michael Shannon, who, like I said before, is just every single line that he says in this movie is a just solid 10 for 10 banger. Michael Shannon is so underrated, so sexy, and so twisted and weird. I would totally kneel before Zod. Like, I am never unhappy to see Michael Shannon in things. Even when I'm like, there's no way Michael Shannon can pull off this role. You're like, oh shit, Michael Shannon can be a lead romance or whatever. Like, oh, he's so good. Um, You have Don Johnson, who is such a smarmy douchebag he is so don johnson is so good at portraying these characters that are just like gross and evil and i genuinely think that don johnson's character uh richard drysdale would be one of the people currently bitching about beyonce's country music album on the internet because you know it's not that he's racist he just doesn't think she should be doing country like his character is so gross speaking of the way they introduce all the characters Mm -hmm. Um, through the interview process or as they're going through each one of them. The interrogation scene. The interrogations are great. It's incredible. It's a great way to, we just started the movie, we know a guy committed suicide, and now we're going to start exposition. And one of my one of the things that usually helps me rate a movie is how the exposition is handled. Sometimes it's just like... Clunky like as a, can be. Like some uh, an actor had a script during ADR and it was just like blah 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 and it was just almost like and when you're watching it sounds like somebody's just reading the script and this happened and this the princess blah 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 lived in the and they couldn't blah 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 oh so in other words like damsel because the exposition we just watched damsel too on Netflix by the way and the exposition in that movie was so clunky and so not half assed but just so sort of like half assedly presented that that, that's kind of what you're there there's fun creative ways to do exposition and this is one of them to to do it in an interview where one at a time you get to meet each character one at a time learn a lot about them in a short amount of time an example of just the worst exposition is the beginning of um david Ayer's suicide squad this is katana (laughs) you don't want to cross her (laughs) No, her, I mean... Her, her blade takes the souls <laughs> of its victims. <laughs> I wouldn't cross her. That man is a cardboard cutout. I mean, everything about David Ayer's Suicide Squad was awful. So, but like, yeah, no, the the way that Ryan Johnson puts together the interrogation scene where you meet all these characters is genius. And it was even, it was written in the script that way. And apparently a lot of people told him because they couldn't see the vision of that scene on the screen like they couldn't see how he was going to do it so when they read that scene they were like oh we're not too sure about this buddy but he just kept being like no you have to trust me like i know what i'm i know what i want i know i have the vision in my head yeah and it uh, is so this is well why played I'm the out. director one of the things i loved about that scene is how every time they flash back to a memory with christopher Plummer's character the memory like each person was focused in the memory in a different way like when michael shannon was talking about his dad's birthday um it shows michael shannon and his wife and his little nazi kid standing there watching his dad blow at the candles but then when jamie lee curtis is talking about that same moment she's behind him and you know as as the dad is blowing out the candles and they're all big smiles and it just goes to show how everybody kind of thought they had a different relationship each, with their father each kid thought that they were they were the center of their father's world yes and and, and they're that when they they're talked not. when they were interviewed and the, and described the night and what they were doing of course they're going to put themselves at the center of the mm-hmm. night not their father 
and but that's not such their a siblings. wonderful touch though just it's oh, so quick the it's small not... details like you said a small detail like his painting changing yes. that i didn't catch and now the next time i watch it i'm definitely yeah. watching it and that so... painting was all cg by the way because it wasn't done by the time I it needed to be figured I love the introduction of Ana de Armas. I think that I'm, I've never been her biggest fan. I kind of find her a little annoying, admittedly. She's just one of those actresses that when I see her, it's not like when I see Evangeline Lilly, who I just despise for so many reasons and cannot stand. And every time I see her, I'm like, oh, fuck, there's Kate from Lost. Like, ugh. You know, it, whereas Ana de Armas does kind of disappear into her roles. Like, she's so much different in this than she is in any other movie. Um, so I don't mind her in this so much, but I still don't 100% fully understand how in this film she had so much chemistry with Chris, uh, with Chris Evans, but in Ghosted, it was like they had never met before and she, were just two cardboard cutouts that oh you're trying goodness. to like work together. Yeah, she didn't, she did not fit Ghosted at all. Oh, well, that movie. The it, whole movie was bad. The writing was bad. Yeah, the, everything was bad about it. Everything was bad about it. Except so, for the Sebastian Stan. But they didn't have chemistry, cameo. but they had, I think, even though they weren't a couple in this movie, they had just but your basic acting of chemistry. chemistry. Anna Darmus' character, Marta, is the nurse to Harlan. And she's not the help she's a live-in nurse but she's treated like the help she's so treated like and she's one a of servant. the things that cracks me up about this movie is how many times everybody says to her you're just like family you're a part of us you're family but like they don't mean it and you know it and so just like watching those every time any of the um thromby family says to her oh you're just like family you're like you're lying right through your teeth the mere fact that they don't know where what country she came from every time somebody has a new south yeah. american country that they list off like, yeah like they have yeah, no she's idea from she... guatemala yeah, yeah she's, she's from, from peru. peru she's from uh uruguay, like, uruguay. Just, yeah, yeah. Like, no her family i, I they, don't think they even say they don't even say because it doesn't matter no. but it, it matters that the family doesn't yes. know all these sort of like white liberal progressive yeah. The rich people, like, they just, the way that they treat her is, it's so subtle. And my favorite moment, jumping ahead just a tiny bit, is when um, the family is having a very politically charged conversation. And Don Johnson is giving this big lecture on what immigrants should do instead of what they do do. You know, like, it's this whole thing. It's this whole him trying to be, like, progressive and, like, I know exactly what the immigrant experience is like and then he just subtly hands his empty plate to marta like she's a housekeeper without even looking at without her. even looking at her it is such a he, subtle he, moment and it's so funny he expected her to take the he plate and she did and she, she took did. it well yeah. yeah because she's a good person she's a good person yeah, she's she has nice a great heart. she she doesn't care about these people because i think she does though well we find way. out later because i feel like christopher plummer's Harlan. character talk shit about his kids to her yeah. a lot he unloads um his feelings and thoughts frustrations, on to, frustrations yeah. onto her um but never seemed in a way it was like like he was treating her like a therapist just he treated her like a friend yeah she was his she was his closest confidant for sure he was the one she was the one that he she was the only the one that wasn't after his money yeah Everybody else was. Which, coincidentally, is why she got everything All the in money. the will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know we moved on from the interview, but during the interview process, I really love how they're framing everybody in front of those knives. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you know the movie's called Knives Out, but you don't know why it's called Knives Out. And you see all these knives from a murder mystery author behind everybody as they're being interviewed. Um, and it is fun that that wall of knives comes into play later yeah the the framing i mean every every scene in this film is so intentional everything has the purpose. cinematography is beautiful um we did fail to mention tony collette who is incredible at playing that ditzy blonde bimbo who's just you know she knows nothing but she knows everything a, a lot of these actors are playing a, a character that they don't normally play there yeah it's, it's very yeah they're all playing kind of like um, tony collette 
doesn't she, usually play a is, bimbo. She is really good at being like the ditzy person, though. She is. No, she's she's absolutely amazing yeah. doing it in you this know, movie. We haven't seen a lot up to this point. We hadn't seen a lot of Chris Evans being like the douchey bad guy because he's Captain America. You know, he's not allowed. You can't see Scott Chris Evans. Pilgrim. Yeah, well, he was a big douche. Yeah, but like he's I don't, not in it very much. When I think of Scott Pilgrim, I don't think of Chris Evans. No, of course not. He's he's a it's a yeah. cameo. It's a but, short cameo. You know, in and in, in every other movie, he's like charming in like a sweet way, whereas in this movie, he's charming in a smarmy way. What was the name of the Russo brothers film that? Oh, oh the, the Gray, Gray Man. Man. Yeah, the I Gray really Man like is his. Such a fun. Movie. I love his douchey. Um, Why are smarmy... you limping? Because I got shot in the ass, Suzanne. <laughs> he's hilarious. In that. <laughs> Even though he's a came... huge douche, he's. He's funny. Yeah, that came after this movie, though. So, like, I, I feel like this uh, was to the first sure, time up to this point, most people knew seen... him as Captain America, and they hadn't seen this side of him. Back to the interrogation scene. It's such a long interrogation scene that that's why we're kind of... Well, it's an, it's all the exposition. Yeah. But they, like, like we said, they this is a fun and creative way to not bore you with exposition. Yeah. And But we're introduced to Benoit Blanc in that scene by a single just, piano <laughs> note. Bing! Um, every time, uh, somebody has, or it's every time he wants the cop who is Lakeith Steinfeld, um, to question the person about who showed up at the party when he hits the piano note. And I think that that's such a brilliant way of bringing your attention to Blanc and it brings the character's attention to Blanc. Um, cause they're all suddenly like, excuse me, who is that? Yeah. Who is this person in the corner? I love when Tony Collette says, I read a tweet about a New Yorker a article New Yorker about article. you. Like she didn't read the article. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis read the article. Sure. Uh, but <laughs> Tony Collette's ditzy character just read a tweet, read about, tweet it. about it. Um, Daniel Craig is so much better than James Bond ever let him be. Every time I see him in something where he gets to be wacky and weird, like Logan Lucky, it's such a weird movie. That's the name. I was trying to look up the name yeah. of that movie because I was like, I can't remember the name of it, but I remember really liking it. Yeah. Logan Lucky. And Daniel Craig is bonkers in that film. He's incredible as Benoit Blanc. Like the accent, that sort of foghorn, leghorn, down home, southern country guy. Like he's just such an incredible actor. And I'm glad that we get to see him in stuff that isn't just James Bond or James Bond adjacent. There you know? Were... <laughs> There were two other moments in, during the interview process that I had to write down because of just the wackiness of this movie and how well I liked the writing. Jamie Lee Curtis's character is questioning about her brother, Michael Shannon's character, about how much he runs the company because she loves and her her younger brother. And she calls, I think she calls him my little brother. Mm-hmm. So she stands up for her brother saying, oh, yeah, he runs the company. He's he's in charge of all this stuff. And the very next scene is her husband, Don, Don Johnson. Johnson, who's like, he doesn't do shit. <laughs> and, like, completely throws Michael Shannon's character under the bus. Don Johnson is so underratedly good in this fucking movie. And this, and if you haven't watched The Watchmen from HBO. Oh, man. Whatever your thoughts were of uh, Zack Snyder's film. Yeah. Watch the HBO series. The HBO series, Watchmen. It's short, is, and it's amazing. It is. I think it's fundamental viewing, honestly, for any, like, pop culture nerd, for any comic book fan, and just in general for any human being, because, like, I never knew about the Tulsa Massacre until that show. It was that show, and at the same time was Lovecraft Country, mm -hmm. and we've lost, we've now... Just very recently. Very recently from Watchmen. Yeah. Louis Gossett Jr. Oh. played on that show. And Michael Kenneth Williams, who was also in Boardwalk Empire um, and um, Lovecraft Country, also died in uh, 2021. But another amazing actor. I just wanted to point those two guys out and those two shows. Uh, and then the other final moment during that interview that I really liked was um, when Don Johnson... Uh, talks about seeing hamilton oh my god the and, hamilton reference but not only did he have to say i saw hamilton yeah but then he has to say i saw it at the public theater yeah which is where it premiered premiered yeah and of course he as a rich douche yeah he absolutely has to let people know that he saw hamilton at the public theater. Mm -hmm. yeah he was one of the first people
You know, real quick, one other actor we lost very recently was M. Emmett Walsh, who has a short scene in this movie as the like security guard on the grounds. And he was just one of those incredible character actors that I was always happy seeing in pretty much anything. He's in a thousand He's movies. in a thousand things. Um, I always very fondly remember him from a very wacky sixth or seventh season X-Files episode. But I can't talk too much about the X-Files because I will start screaming. He was incredible in this uh, movie. And, you know, he also had a good long life. And even though he kind of looked like a walking corpse in this film, he still stuck around for a few more years and did a lot more stuff. He worked right up to the end. So cutting from the interrogation scene and to the scene where we figure out kind of what happened to Harlan. Well, you know, we, we see the truth. Watching him and Marta just talk and laugh and have their kind of casual everyday chats like it was it's really a sweet story of these two friends and I very much enjoyed watching them she's in the process of giving him his nighttime drugs his nighttime medicines as they chat and they play a board game called go which I think came in you know how to play or something like it I used to yeah I used to have uh, both backgammon and go and I had never learned how to play backgammon, even though I tried. Oh, man, we had backgammon sets growing up, too, and I remember like using them as play sets for my dolls, but I couldn't tell you how that game was played at all. I have played Go, but it's been decades by now, and I don't think I... It's not, it's not ingrained in my memory the way chess is. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, so we, we come to find out that it looks like Marta has accidentally poisoned Harlan. Because she's him... reading the labels of the bottles. Because she's le- reading the labels of the bottles. After and she gave him too 10 milligrams yeah. of, of what she thought was one thing. Yeah. And then she reads the bottles because it, she's. we learn later that she's used to picking up a, the right thing. No matter what the yeah. label says, she just instinctively knows that this one's a little cloudier. And therefore, and has a different weight. Yeah, and yeah. therefore, just like she picked one up, at one time you see her pick one up, put it down, and then pick the other one, yeah. the right one up. So the whole scene where he realizes that he's about to die. Apparently, he only has ten minutes to live, and he works very quickly with his, you know, writer brain to try to figure out a way for Marta to not be held accountable for the death. And also, because we come to find out that she's gotten everything in the will, I think that was his way of trying to protect her and keep her, you know, uh, keep her, get her what she's due, basically. Give her the everything in the will, because he doesn't want his family to have it. And what I really love about that whole scene, that whole montage of her leaving the house, coming back, climbing up the trellis, doing all these different things... Um, She has conversations with Harlan during it. Like the voiceover is them talking while she's doing the thing. He's like, now you have to climb a trellis. And she goes, really? And he goes, yeah. But even though at this point in the movie, he's already long dead. uh, It's just really well cut together. That entire scene. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, this film had a lot more humor in it than I think any other Ryan Johnson film, especially. Like you said, Plummer's narration. uh, When... I think it was Don Johnson throws the baseball out the window Mm -hmm. and you see him throw it from inside and then it cuts to just seeing a window and a ball fly out of it. I thought that was really funny. Like I said, the the cinematography is beautiful in this film. Uh, You know who's one person that we haven't talked about yet in this phenomenal cast? Nana. Oh, Nana. <laughs> Nana, who is the mother Ransom? of Harlan. Is that you? So again? she, at one point, somebody asks how old she is, and the reply is just, we don't even know. She's just this old, decrepit woman just <laughs> living in this house. Um, I mean, if, if Harlan was 85, this woman has to be at least, at least 90, 100? At least 100, right? Like, even if she gave birth to him at 15, she's at least 100 years old. Um, And she's always just kind of sitting in the corner, just staring, and she doesn't really talk. Well, yeah, she's in a wheelchair. She's in a wheelchair. Uh, She's totally decrepit. Can't really do much. But, man, every time she's on screen, she's a hoot. She has a couple jump scares, even. And she's such a delight. I think it was very brutal that he commits suicide in front of her. The fact that she sees him slit his own throat is pretty brutal and kind of mean to her. To her. It's a very cruel thing to do to her, especially because he knows that she can't lie. 
he knows that she's going to be questioned about it. He even tells her, like, you don't have to lie. You just don't have to tell the whole truth. S- repeat what I say yeah. in these steps and just these things. But that way, to cause... watch a person that you love, like, slit his own throat. So like, violently, just slit his throat in front brutal, of brutal, man. When we see the aftermath, it's like, oh, that's what... And that is something that I really love about this movie. Not him committing suicide, but uh, the way the secret is revealed at the beginning of the movie like uh other murder mystery movies would not just show you the murder happen if they do the person committing the murder is blacked out they're either wearing clothing that you can't see their body shape or sex height age any of that stuff and they're they're usually blacked out of the screen and killing the victim and you don't find out who did it till the end but this one shows you everything up front this is how it happened. It was they make you believe it's an accident and that he commits suicide. And at the beginning of the movie you're like, All right, what did I miss? That seems Yeah, it's very straightforward. Straightforward it's yeah. suicide. So where are we going now? And I think that's why I really attached myself um to liking this murder mystery movie over many others. Mm-hmm. With uh Marta, her illness, not really an illness, her inability In a, sure, to lie it, her her quirk her quirk yeah i guess you could call it a quirk it's when she she cannot tell a lie without throwing up any kind of fib even um after she gets through all the points that christopher Plummer told her to say mm-hmm. that it's not it's not lying it's not lying she's in her head she still yeah. knows she's keeping something secret and still has a moment where she throws up a little doing absolutely no research do you think that that's a real condition so, oh boy, here he I, goes. I had to look it up. This is from Dr. Kara Gross Margolis. Um, she is a member of the American Gastroenterological Association, which I'm sure is uh, something to do with the gut. And uh, this is a quote from uh, her I've never had a patient who got nauseous or throws up every time they lied. But I think it's a little bit of the stretching of a, of a phenomenon that we see quite often, which is how significant anxiety can lead to nausea and vomiting. Um, so if she gets, if she has such bad anxiety from lying, mm-hmm. it could cause her to be nauseous and throw up. Okay. It's not something that anybody has been reported to have, but... It's not like if phantom was, limb syndrome. It, right, or right. It's not a, it's not an illness or a faces. syndrome that's, that people are known to have. It, th- but it is possible that uh, if she had a high enough anxiety, this it could cause her to throw up. Some of these characters actually do care about their father. I feel like I feel like the children. I feel like his children love him. Oh, his his children absolutely love him. But they also just see dollar signs. Yeah. I mean, in the way that anybody can love a parent who, I mean, we didn't know what his parenting style was. We don't know where the mom is. We don't know what kind of dad he was. We get a little bit of what the kind of dad he was, by the way his kids talk about him. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's character absolutely adored her father. Yeah, they had like really sweet moments. Really with each strong other. relationship. Of all the characters, I think they the the uh, her character and the dad really bond. Uh, yeah, they bond the most for sure, or they are bonded the most for sure. They've got their secret letters that they write to each other. But I bring this up because there was a movie I saw last year that I absolutely adored, and I think more more people need to watch it. And it was nominated for best cinematography this last uh, Oscar season um el conde uh, which means the count it's a chilean film uh, that you can find on netflix about a without vampire? getting it's about a vampire yes and to not get too much into the plot it reminded me a lot of knives out because it's got a family of siblings who are after their father's fortune because he's a vampire and he has uh has lived a long life and he just wants to die he is tired of being a vampire he's tired of living so many centuries and just wants it over with uh and before he goes 
he wants to make sure that his fortune is um saved or, or gone, uh, gone off to gone, the right people yeah but he he knows that his um he knows that his children are just the greediest assholes and does not want to give he does not want his money going to his children so when i when i was watching that movie it reminded me a lot of nights out Before the will is read, we are introduced to the one and only Ransom, played by Chris Evans, who we've already talked about being absolutely such an asshole in this film. But he is so good at it. And when he blows into the family and just causes absolute chaos for all of them, it's so much fun to watch. The way that he gets under everybody's skin... The whole eat shit line. Eat shit. Eat shit. Eat shit. <laughs> and then Michael <laughs> Shannon, I will not eat one iota of shit. Again, Michael Shannon, just the underrated star of this fucking film. Ransom is, he's charming, he's handsome, he's rich, he's a murderer, he's a lot of things. But Chris Evans plays him so well. He does a really, really great job in the role. And it's nice seeing him, because this was also in like the the heyday of Captain America. So we were used to him being truth, justice in the Captain America way. So seeing him be this like asshole character was a delight. Even though the cast in this movie was so strong already, I think one of the big draws for me to go watch it um, was probably because of Chris Evans, because I did love him so much as Captain America. They definitely used him as the main draw, you know, because you didn't know that he was going to be, you kind of knew that he was going to be a douchey character, but you didn't know that he was. Yeah, they were, they, the yeah. whole family's just a uh, douchey character. Yeah. So, I mean, he's just another one that's being douchey. I love when the whole family is like arguing, like just bitterly arguing with each other and even like scrapping just a little bit the cops are just standing in the background watching it They're, okay so the 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 slap fight that go, that's that uh, michael shannon and don johnson have oh together, it's a delight i love that you that ryan johnson got michael shannon and don johnson to have this really uh childlike sibling fight yeah by just slapping at each other and oh, it's just great they're so wonderful and then Michael Shannon um, is like yell asking at Chris Evans, just "You want a cookie? You want a cookie?" Like at no, like what? Okay. <laughs> he has a line which I don't know verbatim, but he talks about how uh, maybe he'll leave you a nice cold glass of milk in the will because they all kind of knew that he had been cut out of the will that Ransom, or right? I think they knew that Ransom had been cut out of the will. Either way. By that moment. Yeah, because they all heard. You no, know, they knew about it because of the Nazi kid was masturbating in the bathroom. That's right. And heard... That's right. That, that's why they were so smug when he came in. Yeah, it's because they all knew. They knew they weren't saying anything, but no. they knew he was written out. Because Michael Shannon's little Nazi teenager son was masturbating in the bathroom in his granddad's office and heard the argument. This movie is so fucking funny, guys. Like, really, truly, hey. watch it again. It's so good. Well, and it always helps to watch it again because I completely forgot... That the guy reading the will was Frank Oz. As soon as he came on Frank screen, Oz. I was like, oh yeah, Frank Oz is in this movie. <laughs> Yoda and Miss Piggy is in this movie. If you guys don't know who Frank Oz is, because yeah, I don't what know. What are we doing I don't here? know the what audience. What are we doing here? I don't know the audience we have. I don't know your age or anything. So for those of you who don't know Frank Oz, you know, he voices a lot of characters that you have grown up with, maybe. <laughs> you got... Of course, Yoda. Yoda's probably the biggest voice, the most uh, iconic voice. Between Yoda and Miss Piggy, those are probably the two most iconic voices he's ever done. Uh, he also does Bert and um, Grover, Cookie Monster, Fozzie Bear, Sam the Eagle. He... You mean Oscar Isaac in Muppet form? Sorry, sure. that's a deep cut for okay. no one but me. Hey, I'm glad we're doing a podcast for you. <laughs> <laughs> to you. Uh, but he's also a very great established director. You've got Dark Crystal, Muppets Take Manhattan, Little Shop of Horrors, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, What About Bob, The Indian in the Cupboard, In and Out, Bowfinger, and one of my favorites, 
Death at a Funeral. The original British Death at a Funeral. We need to do a bonus episode on the original British. Actually, on both versions of Death Compare at a Funeral. Them. Because the the American uh, version, the, the American redone, is... Not it's bad. Solid. It's solid. Especially keeping Peter Dinklage in it was nice. But it's the, not bad. But the, the British, British one is. It's one of the funniest British comedies outside of like Monty Python. It's a laugh a minute. If you haven't seen that film, guys, it's so. Go check out the British version of Death at a Funeral. Uh, that's something that Caveman and I quote often when we look at each other and go, "Everything's so fucking green." <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the way once the will is read and they the, it is revealed that Marta is the sole inheritance of everything. She gets everything. Um, the the speed in which first first we have uh, uh, Christopher Plummer's character dies and the whole family is like Marta. If there's anything You're you family. need, you are family to us. We will. We'll take care we'll of take you. We'll take care of you. We will give you money and we will take. She's a first of all. She's a nurse. It's not like she's destitute because she lost uh, a, her a job. client. Yeah, like she's gonna have another client. It's her job, but they're just they're they're treating her like she's been suckling on the Christopher Plummer teeth this whole time. Yeah, and she's just doing her job, and they're like, "We'll take care of you. You're fine." And but then once it's revealed that now she's richer than any of them. Yeah, the way they, they just turn, turn on, on her, her like so animals. Fast. Yeah, they they accuse her of um, of screwing their father of uh, blackmail yeah of, of everything that they could think of as a reason why their dad would give and they keep this... bothering frank oz the lawyer yeah. like trying to come up with ways and he just won't... Like blaming when, him for this when jamie lee curtis says like this is still our house and then they all turn and look at frank oz and frank oz looks at the very small will and goes uh no the house is also left to marta uh so <laughs> so funny and for that poor girl like i she should have I guess maybe she would have been aware if things hadn't gone the way that they did. Um, it, well, I wonder. I mean, it makes me wonder if he ever would have told her. But ever, maybe, maybe not. But the fact that he, yeah, he left everything to her, and the whole family was left out. Shockingly, was truly a, a delightful scene. I also found it very sweet. I noticed these things because I'm a romantic and me. But there's a moment when everybody's like freaking out because Marta has just been, you know, named heir to the you know, throne, throne yeah. basically the knife throne, the knife throne, uh, the, <laughs> the steel throne that, uh, everybody kind of like all the, the family members get up and kind of move towards her and Blanc very protectively stands in front of her. And I just, I, I like moments like he that. He puts himself in between. He puts himself between her these, uh, and er, these even though I don't think he was members. ever a cop. Like, I don't know what his backstory is, but just the, I know they never get into it, but he does, he does throw, he does show, uh, concern and um i don't know another yeah, word. just care like it, and i find that sweet if any of you have watched the david tennant uh catherine tate much ado about nothing um there's a moment where david tennant's very protective towards another character and i watched that like 17 times don't just... anyways so she gets all the money as she rushes out of the house to try to get away from the family she ends up kind of riding off with ransom and and going off with him where she then tells him the whole story about what happened between her and Harlan. So now Ransom knows the truth about what happened to his grandpa. So Chris Evans comes to Marta's rescue and, you know, to get her away from the family. But he's got his own uh, devious plans already. He, he's got his own. He essentially is um, using Marta to figure out what happened. His death was supposed to be accidental, not suicide. Yeah. Uh, if it's suicide, nobody gets money? No, I think that if it's suicide, she still gets the money because ultimately it was a it was a suicide, so she still gets all the money. But Ransom wants it to be a, uh, an accidental death. He wants... He wants her to be because okay. He hires Ransom. Benoit. Yeah, ban Ransom knows that everything's being left to Marta, so he switches the uh, morphine and the other drug in order to um, enact what is known as the Slayer Clause. I think where um, she wouldn't get the will, so she wouldn't be the benefactor of the will because she was responsible for Harlan's death, sure. and. And even though it was an accident, even though it was just because she, you know, mistook the bottles, um, she is still legally responsible for his death 
even you know and, and thus yeah well, she wouldn't get anything um the fact that harlan then killed himself because it was supposed to look like an accidental death the fact that harlan killed himself is what kind of created all the chaos right it means it's a suicide now all the money is guaranteed to go to marta yeah. and uh, ransom won't get anything yeah and he's trying to help her quote unquote uh figure out you know what to do because he wants his share of he wants the his will. share he wants to figure out uh what happened and why it wasn't an accidental death and he's trying to figure out how much evidence the police have found yeah but ultimately it's because he wants the money he thinks he's due One scene um, where Meg, who is played by Catherine Langford, um, and in the, throughout the whole movie, Meg, who's like a young college student, um, she is the daughter of Ransom's, uh, no, she's the daughter of Harlan's dead son. Um, Tony Collette is his mother, is her mother. Um, still milking the teat of the rich family, even though she's connected, but not really connected to her in-laws anymore. And everybody's really tired of her being there, which I find delightful. Yeah. Uh Jamie Lee Curtis and the way that she treats Tony Collette's character is so funny. Catherine calls up uh, Marta to be like, hey, girl, like, how you doing? Everything okay? But, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to give us the money? Because her family makes her. Her family knows that Marta and Meg are close, that they've got a better rapport than, than Marta has with the rest of the family. So they use her to, like, get at her. And I just thought that that was so devious and mean when you know the you think that Marta and Meg are just having this like conversation, but then the camera pulls back to reveal the whole, whole family standing behind her, yeah, trying to like manipulate the situation. I found that very delightful. I also loved when Michael Shannon tried to like threaten Marta in the hallway of her apartment complex when the news gets a hold of the fact that this famous mystery writers left everything to his nurse instead of his family when michael shannon is like threatening her or not threatening her he's being gentle about his threats but ultimately he's like well you know what about your mom who's undocumented what about her like if you gave us you know the money then we could help we'll take care we've of you. got all the resources we know how to do this the correct way you don't know how to yeah how to be rich we've got the money so we'll hire the lawyers and we'll do all that for you and she's just like oh well thanks for the idea basically she's like <laughs> like you just told me exactly what to do so thanks yeah, um, i'm gonna go get some lawyers i love that i love the way that she turned it around on him Did you notice any time that you've watched this film that Benoit Blanc is the first person to offer condolences to Nana for the fact that her son died? He's the only person that talks to her like a normal person and with any level of concern because, you know, Harlan is her son and her son just died. Mm. So Benoit Blanc's the only person to offer condolences. And I found that very sweet. I thought that it was a very telling moment for his character which is kind and, you know, gentle and caring. I mean, we and we'll see even more of that giant, that kind, gentle character of Benoit Blanc in Glass Onion. One person we haven't talked about, too, who's really awesome in this. I mean, she's got very few lines, and she's always just in the background, but it was really great to see Ricky Lindholm uh, playing the wife of Michael Shannon's character. You may not know her name, but you know her as this really wonderful comedy actress. She is in a musical duo called Garfunkel and Oates with Kate Micucci. Uh, she was on this incredibly funny and twisted Comedy Central series called Another Period. Um, yeah. She's just a That's fabulous. Really funny. Yeah. <laughs> Another Period is great. She's just a fabulous uh, comedian, and I adore her. So I was really like, oh, you know what? Good for you seeing her hold her own in this play or in this movie, especially because she's playing this like uptight blonde, you know, conservative sort of like snatched pearls woman. <laughs> um, and knowing that she's anything but, but I, I was really glad for her to have such a kind of a beefy, you know, line on her resume. Like good for you. You were in knives out. Like that's great. Y you care about the, the little people. <laughs> oh, when you, when you see, 
people you've been following forever with their tiny, their really yeah, their small, small career. careers. They're just and, the little things and that you they're see doing. It just gradually grow, and they're they're in a, a bigger project, and then a bigger project, and then and then finally. But you still see, doing their fun little stuff. Yeah, absolutely, and um, it's just when you really like an actor or a director or, you know when they're and you see them start off small and become big it's fun to see that journey yeah i was i was always i'm always really happy to see her in anything her and kate micucci somebody that i could compare that to for myself would be james gunn i remember when james gunn was he had one movie under his belt mm -hmm. and then he i think it was i'm pretty sure it was slither did he do slither before or after super I think Slither was first. Slither is uh, hopefully a movie that we can revisit come Halloween time because it's one of the few, uh, like, scary movies that I like. It's it's a very twisted sort of, like, dark horror humor. It's a fun one, but it's definitely one of his uh, earlier works. I think we are planning... This is way down the line from now, but there there's some uh, some some stuff coming out for Halloween and Christmas this year for our podcast. Yeah, it's neat that we get to. Um, I mean, it is so far away, and who knows what's going to happen between now and then. But I mean, it's only April. It's only April, but we, you know, we are already talking about how we want to do like the holidays and the holiday movies, and it's just it's a lot of fun planning this whole thing with you shapoopy uh i'm having a ton of fun so yes you are correct slither was his first film uh followed that up by yeah uh, some more tv series yep super was next. Forest films and then you directed a segment from movie 43 which yoif and then immediately in the guardians galaxy he he really didn't he was direct... all over the place in the beginning well yeah in his director way like he's been writing things forever but direction but I... so i <laughs> I remember watching him on a show that I used to watch on G4 called Attack of the Show. Attack of the Show! He was a regular guest on that show. I remember him on that. He he was funny. He was so young. Uh, you know, that young uh, director with a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, uh, gumption. And he was, there was one time where he uh, was on to talk about a video game that he wrote called Lolli uh, Lollipop. Do you need me to look it up or does it matter? Because we're already well off topic. I know. We're so off topic. That's <laughs> what we do. It doesn't matter. Um, but seeing him go from this uh, guest on a basic cable channel um, nerd show to gradually more movies he's directing. More and more things. And uh, then fucking Marvel. And now he yeah. is in control of DC um, Cinematic Universe. Such a great guy. And so, yeah, seeing somebody small become somebody even bigger is really fun to watch real quick uh the reason why i saw slither for the first time was because my best friend jesse shout out my darling was going through a nathan fillion phase where she was obsessed with everything that he did and so she made me come over to his house and watch or to her house and watch slither because uh she was just obsessed with nathan fillion back in the old days man the old days remember that jess those are some good times Um, Fran's death was particularly brutal. That the was th a really brutal killing. I remember the first time I saw that movie and all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, Fran's trying to blackmail uh, Ransom because she knows that she saw him tampering with the medical bag. And because there's this whole like we haven't touched on it, but there's this whole like blackmail uh, storyline. It's kind We're of not a gonna... B storyline. Yeah, it's kind of a B story. We're not going to go into it. But anyways, what Ransom does is he like lures her to this old laundromat and injects her with a bunch of morphine. And then when we see her for the first time, because um, uh, Marta's character is like now in the laundromat trying to figure out who's quote unquote blackmailing her. When we see Fran for the first time, she's sitting there, you know, eyes wide open, looking like she's dead with a spider crawling on her face, which bleh. the spider was the spider was definitely a great it was touch to show you how dead she was. No, but she wasn't dead. No, but you don't know that as an audience. No, member. you don't you think she's you just dead. think that she's dead. But the spider was uncomfortable. And I remember the first time I saw that movie, I was like, I don't like this. This was unnecessary. She ultimately reveals to Marta that, you know, quote unquote you did you this. You did this. You did this. But what she's actually saying is Hugh did this. Hugh. 
because he, uh, he insists that the servants and other uh, workers around the house call, call him, him by his first name. Yeah, which is even Hugh. though everybody else calls him Ransom because he's a rich white douchebag. And then that basically brings us to the big reveal. Which is one of my favorite things about any detective movie. Um, I'm a big fan of the Kenneth Branagh Puro movies. Um, a Murder in Venice or the Venice one. A Haunting. A Haunting in Venice. Thank you. That is a particularly well done movie. Uh, Death on the Nile was a lot of fun. The other one. Like, I like a good detective movie. I love a good, you know, if you haven't seen the Thin Man movies um, with uh, William um, Powell and uh, uh, Myrna Loy. Myrna Loy. I always love the big, like, all right, we're right, everybody's in the room and we're going to figure it out. And yeah, it's been spoofed a lot. And, you know, it's kind of been done to death. But when it's done right... It's so much fun. Daniel Craig is a big part of just why this movie works. I don't think that... Obviously, I can't imagine Benoit Blanc being played by any other character because he is just so charming and it's so well done. Um, but I, I don't know of any other character that could kind of get into the goofy physicality of the role of the way that he's so studious in the background. Like you, Your eye kind of travels to him and you see him watching people. Like, he's fun, and he's having fun. I kind of wonder what it would be like if you switch Daniel Craig and Kenneth Branagh as the, as actors and put them in their, each other's movies. How they would, there's compared to... Stupid cat. <laughs> I don't know. I, Kenneth Branagh is a delightful person. He has done a lot of really fun and funny movies. Um... You know, like, I, I adore Kenneth Branagh, an, another one of Jesse's uh, deep obsessions, which I wholeheartedly agree with. He's just so handsome. But I don't, maybe it's because of his age now, but I don't think that if Kenneth Branagh played Benoit Blanc, I don't think that he would have as much fun as Daniel Craig is having. And Daniel Craig is having so much fun. You can see it. You especially see it in Glass Onion. Like, that whole uh, cast is having just a ball. But I just, you know, I, I just don't know. I, I think that Kenneth... And I also don't even think that um, Daniel Craig could play a good uh, pure role because he's not old enough. I think that there's just an, an age barrier there. I think he's old. I, th I mean, no, like Kenneth Branagh has got a good ten years on him, and it it's needed for the pure role versus Benoit Blanc. It needs to be a little more youthful and a little Craig's more fun. Old enough. Well, I just you asked my opinion, and I'm giving it. Ooh, 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 ooh. Um, I like um, Daniel Craig's accent. It's fuck. very different to hear his uh, very as a. Uh, as uh, he points out and says, uh, CSI KFC. <laughs> That's such a cheesy line. There is one I love thing it I know. There is one <laughs> thing about these movies, which are they are they're a bit held down by the times that they were filmed in. So like, there's there's references. There's like their humor is very topical to the time that they were filmed and came out, especially in Glass Onion right. with the whole COVID thing, which does I don't know how well it's going to play. 50 years down the line i mean there are definitely references you know? in this one where ransom calls marta baby driver because yeah. of the way she's driving and speeding and the, running away from the cops the jokes are a little too topical which is my only real like critique it's fun. of the film it's always fun in the moment when you're watching you're just like ha, yeah. ha, baby driver I but like then a movie. few years later you're like oh boy like, oh, <laughs> baby driver did not age well like if you watch movies from the 80s or 90s that have topical you watch them now and you're just like oh maybe they shouldn't have been so topical yeah it's not it's, and you don't always remember the jokes like how it doesn't it because it, you want a movie especially good movies to be ageless it definitely helps and you know in 25 years are people really going to remember csi i mean they will because it's a part of the cultural le lexicon but like you know, even you just had to take a second to be like, wait, what? I was like, wait, where are we talking about yeah. CSI? So, <laughs> and then it's like, oh yeah, the CSI KFC. So that's my own critique of this film is I find the humor a little too topical. And that will probably be a, a critique that I have for Glass Onion as well, because it's very sort of COVID related. But you know what? It's still a great film and it doesn't affect it. You know, it, it doesn't hurt the film in my eyes. Ransom had to burn down a... Ransom had to burn down 
a uh, medical examiner's a, office. Right. That's that's bold move. That really is. I mean, murdering somebody is pretty bold. But, yeah. Like, but, but then going out and burning down a medical examiner's and office. And all the evidence that was with it. I mean, he tampered with the evidence of countless not, yeah, cases. Not just the murder of Christopher Plummer's character, but yeah, yeah. countless cases that were probably saved. And um, he sort of shrugs it off, being like, oh, I'm just going to get an arson charge. Like, no, he... He legit screwed up the entire judicial process of that town for some time because he burned everything. That is a very bold move. But he was he was trying to be more clever. He wanted to. Sh I mean, yes, he was trying to be more clever. He was trying to be as clever as he wanted his grandpa to think that he was. But and he he, he really wasn't. he just wanted to. He obviously did it because he wanted to get rid of the uh, evidence that just showed that his. His uh, uh, grandfather had no signs of any yeah, well, extra. The, yeah, there was just normal traces of the morphine. And, yeah, it was and, just and normal drugs, yeah. morphine, normal. Um, because Marta's a better nurse, and she's a great nurse and a good person. Because so, yeah. she was going to admit to the family that it was you know was that just his about death to do it, was her then, fault. Yeah, and then Benoit reads the yeah. medical examiner's report. When she uh, tells Ransom that Fran is alive, and then throws up in his face. Mm. Oh. <laughs> like it's really such chunky. An, it's so chunky. It's, it's like such because I don't. I think they hide the vomit throughout the majority. I think she, yeah, maybe you don't the ever very see the vomit. You no, see. you don't really ever see. Like, she's, she's really she's good at being polite screen, about yeah. not showing everything. But and when she just like throws up in chunks. his face, oh, oh. <laughs> and then like you have to look at him with like yeah, vomit it's on all his over. Face. He's just like reacting to being in his face and trying to yeah. wipe it away and yeah. just being disgusted by that. And then uh, one of my favorite uh, Chris Evans scenes. Of just the way it's played out with him, because now he wants to. He realizes he, that he reacts. His gut yeah. reaction is to kill Marta, so he just grabs a knife off the the the, the, throne. the throne, yeah, and uh, tackles her to the ground and stabs her in the chest. And you're like, oh shit! He just stabbed her in the chest, mm -hmm. and then just the slow up of the reveal knife, that it's a problem. That it's a problem. But then it's when he goes back down and up. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. That's <laughs> genius filmmaking. It's <laughs> such a funny moment because that could have been played a hundred different ways, but the fact that they played it with a little ee -ee -ee -ee, which uh, it does call back to a line that um, uh, Christopher Palmer has in the beginning, where he says that Ransom, Ransom doesn't wouldn't know a, know a prop knife from a knife real knife. knife. Yep. Yeah, it's um, a great callback. It really is a great callback, and that then, you're not expecting when it happens. No. When you see that knife plunged through her chest, you're not thinking to yourself. Well, I don't even know Plummer those knives said, were fake. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you don't even know. Well, and I don't, like, I always wondered if there were real ones up there and fake ones mixed in. Yeah, and so he just grabbed were, the... And he just happened to grab a fake one. I don't one. know. He, I mean, he did have children around the house at some point. I can't imagine that he would have a, re a throne of real knives. But, you, yeah, like, who's to say? The way that this movie ends with Marta standing on the balcony looking down mm. at all the family members, you know holding the coffee cup that just says my house because her fingers are covering up the other part. It's so brilliant. And they're all staring up at her and they all know that they're going to get shit. I mean, I think in my heart, I feel like she's a nice, nice enough person that she will either give them a little money and say, this is the only amount that you get. Or, or I think she's going to help out Meg. Might maybe get through her through college. Yeah, she might like offer like I'll finish. You've got I'll finish your schooling. Other than the time when the adult children convinced her to call and mm -hmm. uh, betray her, uh, Marta essentially. Uh, I think Meg was completely blameless in everything. She was. She really was the best of all those family members. It wasn't her fault that her mom was skimming money off the top, to, no. uh, taking two uh, tuitions, mm -hmm. sending one to the school and keeping another tuition for Which, herself. I mean, like, I kind of guess I know where all that money went, but where did all that money go? Uh, yeah, I know. A tuition's worth? I yeah. Mean, like four years of a tuition's worth? Like, Jesus. That's a lot that's of money. That's a lot of money. Uh, Especially a prestigious, like, I'm sure she has a lot York. of she was expecting a check from her father in law on a consistent basis um well she didn't expect she didn't expect her de her father in law to figure it out yeah and he did and now she's broke because he's not paying her anymore he gives her one more check and was like 
Yeah, there you go. That's your last one. Yeah. Ultimately, um, it's something that we didn't really touch upon, but like everybody in the family is somehow screwing over Harlan's character. Like everybody is taking advantage Everybody's of the dad. Doing something. Um, you know, was... Don Johnson's cheating on Jamie Lee Curtis and doesn't want her to find out. Um, Michael Shannon's not a good publisher. He's not running the company well, and his dad decides to fire him. Chris Evans is just a dick. Um, Tony Collette is stealing money. What What did Jamie Lee Curtis's character? I think, other than being kind of an overbearing bitch, I don't think she did do anything wrong. Yeah, because the only thing that's tied to her but, is her cheating husband. Yeah, but is that why he? I don't know why he would cut her out of the will for the fact that her husband's cheating on her. There must have been. There may was there like there must have been a like line. And there must have been a line. Honestly, I don't remember. Not in this current moment. No. And. Yeah, maybe the next time we watch it, we'll catch on. Like, oh, or maybe yeah. it's just because of how she acted. You know, she wasn't a nice person. She, you know, she was Ransom's mother. She was willing to stick with her husband, who's such a dick. Like, maybe he was just fed up with her so the same way that he was. There was a line. Yeah, like there has to be something. But or something they were doing everybody. But it doesn't matter. Oh, well. But, uh, yeah. So, and that brings us to the end of the movie. And I was really happy to rewatch it. I'm really happy that we got to sit down and talk about it. Um, it's, it's a fun film. After the scene of the family looking up at Marta and Mar Marta looking down at them mm -hmm. and the coffee mug from the beginning coming back at the end. And just perfectly too, because I mean, now it's more has more meaning. Yeah. Um, my my home, my rules, yeah. my coffee, <laughs> and <laughs> her mug now too. Yeah, everything um, in that house belongs to her. It's all hers. So after that great ending, even though I really liked the song, it was an interesting choice to I put in. I couldn't tell you what that song was. Oh, it was "Sweet Virginia" by the Rolling Stones. I, it's, I, it's not. It's not. I I don't think it's it's not a, like a top tier Rolling Stones yeah. song that you hear a lot. It's not but like a I thought it, for the devil. I thought it was a nice fitting end, um, music wise, but I had to look at the lyrics just to see if there was anything that I could puzzle out, you know, figure out to mm -hmm. to see if it tied in at all with what I had just watched. And after looking at the lyrics, like really looking at it, I don't I can't find anything that's um really significant. Not that not that every song choice has has to have Well, but everything in this movie is so deliberate. Which is why I mean but I could I the Gordon read. Lightfoot song playing in the background when Ransom and Marta are having their conversation, yeah. which is Sundown, that the lyrics of that song play heavily into the film. And I'm I'm not gonna go into the details, I just know that it does. And also Gordon Lightfoot, man, ripped to a legend. That guy is a phenomenal musician and I will love him forever. I'll let you be the judge of if this um song has any kind of significance as far as tying into the film itself. Uh Wading through the waste, stormy winter, and there's not a friend to help you through. Trying to stop the waves behind your eyeballs. Drop your reds, drop your greens and blues. Thank you for your wine, California. Thank you for your sweet and bitter fruits. Yes, I got the desert in my toenail, and I hid the speed inside my shoe. But come on, come on down, sweet Virginia. Come on, honey child. Beg you, come on, come on down. You got it in you. Got to scrape the shit right off your shoes. I want you to come on and sing it with me one time. All right. Yeah, I want you to come down. And yeah, and just it repeats on. the course. There, as I, I read it, maybe just, there's a few There's a few there's lines, like, like the lines about things. her kind of being like on her own. Waste and, through the stormy winter. Yeah. Um, wiping the shit off her shoe because she literally like wiped the shit of that family. You know, and, and everything's better. I don't know. Like, I didn't run into the fact that that song didn't fit the way that you oh, did I didn't, I didn't run into it i just like to when i hear a song especially an end credit song i like to f f try to figure out why that song was yeah, chosen because we have been conditioned to uh the end credit songs being very like the the proper wrap-up to a film um but yeah i don't i don't like you said especially with a film that has Is just so much deliberate? meaning and yeah. so much like easter eggs and so much yeah I don't everything's know. deliberate maybe that's something you should look into could just be a uh, favorite song, a uh, favorite Rolling Stones maybe song. Maybe it was Ryan a song. Johnson. Maybe it's about the mood of the song, and not necessarily the lyrics. Maybe it's about the mood, and you know, maybe Ryan Johnson liked that song while he was writing the script. Like it, it could be a thousand. It reasons, could be a thousand. But things. I, I was just wondering if okay, you. That's fair. Yeah. 
So Maggie, after mm -hmm. now your second time watching this movie, out of five stars, what are you giving it? I'm going to give it a solid... Uh, I'm kind of torn between a four and a 4.5. I'm going to give it a 4.5. I'm going to give it a 4.5. It's, I, I don't know, I'm torn. I'm torn just because I don't know if it deserves, it's not a five-star movie. It's not Into the Spider-Verse. Does this mean Glass Onion is a five-star movie? Uh, no. So I'm going to give it a four then. But I don't know. Maybe I won't like Glass Onion as much when we revisit it. How many like, times have you watched Glass Onion? I like, like three or four. Really? I've yeah. only seen it once. I mean, I watched it, I, I know I've watched it twice, and then I've watched a bunch of YouTube people watch it, which means I've seen 10-minute clips of the film here and there, so... Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to kind of hover solidly around the 4 range because it's a great film, it's a great cast, it's well written, it's well put together, it's a ton of fun. There are a couple flaws here and there that don't really, you know, mean much to me in the end, but uh it's not a perfect film, but it is a fun, watchable, entertaining movie. So yeah, I'd give it a solid 4. It's great. What about you? For the originality of the story since I love murder mystery movies, and the acting power and how great the writing was, I'm just going to go for 4.5. That's fair. It deserves it. I mean, this isn't a two-star film. This is a... It, it, it makes sense as to why it's in the top 10 of the Letterbox top 60 movies. It's fun and entertaining and bright and, you know, it's... It's not a downer the way that Interstellar the Joker was. It's not... Um, it makes you think like everything, everywhere, all at once and Parasite, but it comes at everything with just a lighter, just fun way about it. And I'm glad for that. I'm glad that like people still want to watch movies that are kind of screwball and silly. You know, it, it means that there's always going to be an audience for the lighter side of things. You know, this movie has a lot of heavy topics, but it keeps everything light and it's nice to see. So um, I'm glad for it. I'm, I'm glad for Ryan Johnson. I cannot wait for the third film. I know it's in development, but we know nothing about it. And frankly, I want to know nothing about it. Just when's it going to air and bring it to me, please. Hey, Maggie. Yes, caveman. I have two questions for you. Yay. First question. Mm-hmm. Would the presence of Oscar Isaac <sighs> have made this film better? Yes, because putting him in anything makes everything better. Seems to be a running theme in this. Well, he is the most beautiful man on this planet. We just went to see Ex Machina on the IMAX screen, and it was my first time seeing that movie in its completion. I've only seen half of it up to this point. Um, but seeing Oscar Isaac's arm vein, like, nine feet long on an IMAX movie screen. Oh, it did things. I've only seen Ex Machina twice now. Yeah. And the first time I saw it was on my cell phone. So from seeing cell phone size, <laughs> cell phone size. to IMAX size. Oh, God, that arm vein got so big. It was amazing. <laughs> Question two. Yes. Which character would you have had Oscar Isaac play? So I've got my kind of funny answer and my real answer. Okay. Uh, uh, my funny answer is that I think he could have replaced, if you could have replaced Oscar Isaac with Anna Darmus completely. And like his name still could have been Marta. And like you literally just take her out and put in Oscar Isaac. <laughs> I would love to see that. Cause I, a, I think he'd do an incredible job. Uh, B I want to see him throw up on somebody. Don't ask me why. And <laughs> C. <God. laughs> <laughs> that's not God, true weird shit are you into <laughs> whatever that man wants to do he can do i love him so much so that's my jokey answer my actual answer would even though i know that noah segan is a big um friend of ryan johnson and has been in everything that ryan johnson has ever done he played a uh, trooper wagner who was a ton of fun throughout the entire movie being like the nerdy like guy who loves was really into the, the mystery Plummer's novels books. yeah um he was a delight but i think you could have put uh oscar isaac into that role and it would have been just as fun and a lot more handsome that would have been too much though because there are way too many beautiful people in this movie you know what i it doesn't matter just give me all the beautiful people all over my face beautiful neck and chest people. beautiful people 
And that's this week's episode of Movie Mingle. We hope that you enjoyed it. We thoroughly enjoyed recording it. Uh, Join us next week where we will be talking about The Batman, which was a decisive movie, but a movie that, spoilers, I fucking love. So I cannot wait to talk about The Batman with all of you and with my caveman. You can find us on Instagram at Movie Mingle Pod. You can find us on Letterboxd, also at Movie Mingle Pod, where you get to follow along with how I, Maggie, rate all of the movies that we've watched and also just all the movies that I've seen so far this year. And you can always email us at movieminglepod at gmail.com. Currently, the inbox for that only has messages from Letterbox about their security. So please, write us a letter. Let us know how, you, how you're doing. And uh, Oscar Isaac, you especially, feel free to reach out anytime. And that's it for this week. Now go mingle. Are you an effective team? We are an effective team. Let them fight. How did you just do that? I'm a really good lawyer. Here on Caladan, we've ruled by air power and sea power. On Arrakis, we need to cultivate desert power. Welcome, Mr. Beach. What's that bar? Uh, I'm a little confused. Oh, we wouldn't want that, would we? I don't want to brag, but I will. I was in the Avengers. The Avengers? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What is that? I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Toga. Toga. Toga.